Hey y'all, really quickly before we get started, we wanted to tell you about a podcast we absolutely love. You are about to listen to a promo for Women in Crime. Please do not skip it. These two fabulous ladies are both criminology professors and they know their shit. The podcast is all about women in crime. They have some fabulous episodes. They also did a really great episode about race and crime. Um, which was super, super interesting. They've got a lot of insight and a lot of facts to back things up with. So definitely check it out and enjoy the promo. Hey, Killer Queens listeners. Did you ever listen to a true crime podcast and felt like you're left with questions like, why did she do it? Or how could this have happened to her? Then you'll definitely want to check out our podcast, Women in Crime. I'm Amy Slashberg. I'm Megan Sachs. My co-hosts and I are both criminologists. We've spent our entire career studying crime and both have firsthand experience working within the criminal justice system. Each episode, you'll hear a new female-focused case or topic deconstructed by experts. You'll hear the stories of these women, but you'll also learn why these crimes happened and whether or not the criminal justice system got it right or not. Crime is different for women. Come listen and learn why, as each episode, we talk women in crime all of the time. So hit pause and subscribe to Women in Crime today on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. That's Women A-N-D Crime. Hello and welcome to Killer Queens, a true crime podcast. I'm your host, Torella. And I'm your better, prettier, younger host, Tori. We're sisters who are obsessed with true crime and love gal palin with you about cases. You can expect the occasional curse word, lots of friends quotes, and all the 90s nostalgia. To get in on the conversation, check us out at killerqueenspodcast.com. You can also find us on Instagram and Facebook at Killer Queens Podcast, and we're on YouTube at Killer Queens, a true crime podcast. Okay, y'all, grab your Capri Suns or your Surge, and let's talk about some true crime. Welcome to Killer Queens. I'm Tori. I'm Torella. And we're so glad you're here. Oh my God. Welcome. Yeah, we are. Yeah. Oh my God. I'm excited too. Oh my God. Thank you so much for coming over. But not really. Social distancing. <laughs> yeah. Stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. Yeah. Tori and I are social distancing. We're recording remotely. Just trying to do our part here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Before we get started, as always, if you want extra episodes, check out the Patreon. We just... uh release some totallybomb.com benefits. Oh, wow. Yeah, I went there, but it's true. They're all that in a bag of chips. That's You're not wrong. It's totally true. So we got some new stuff in the Patreon. You should check it out. And of course, we've got lots of episodes. I mean, there's like over 100 episodes to binge right now. Wow. And binging is a booming. Oh, it sure is. Yeah. Hmm. Felt weird saying it. I don't know. Let's move on. Let's move on. Today, we are going to be covering the case of Jamie Kloss. And this was a recommendation by... Oh, this one was highly requested. Kelsey Mower, Erica McKnight, Brandy Scott, Joe, Jenna Torres, Steve Porter. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. And Steve, if you think that I have forgotten (laughs) about you calling me out, I didn't. No. Tori doesn't forget. No. An elephant never forgets. <laughs> You're on my list. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah, I think he was coming for the people that were coming for you. Really? Mm. Yeah. Well, sometimes. He was coming for everybody. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Guns a blazing. Guns a blazing. Yeah. yeah. So thank you guys for recommending this case. I knew a little bit about it. But I didn't know all the details, of course. I mean, I I hadn't researched it. So special thanks to me for researching and writing this case. (laughs) Oh my God. Thanks, girl. You're welcome, girl. Whatever. Yeah. All right. Let's just, let's just get going. This is getting silly. Okay. Okay. In the early morning hours of October 15th, 2018, the Kloss family was sound asleep in their ranch style home in Barron, Wisconsin. With a population of about 3,400, Barron is a small town located about 90 miles east of Minneapolis. It's bordered by dense forest and other rural towns. There's not a whole lot in Barron. One of the most notable things there is the Jenny O. Turkey Factory, which I have 
totally purchased those turkeys before. Oh, great. Yeah. You're totally supporting. I know. I can like, I can see the logo and everything. The city being so rural and spread out is probably exactly why nobody heard or saw what happened to the Kloss family around 1 a.m. on October 15th. As the family lay sleeping, a car they didn't recognize pulled into the driveway and the family dog Molly began barking. Now, Molly is not what you would call a security dog. Molly is a teeny, (laughs) precious baby. I don't know what kind of dog she is. I just don't know. She she's just one of those teeny like she's not a multi poo or anything like that. She's darker, but she's little like that. Okay. Well, with a name like Molly, you would expect that. Yeah, she's a little she's a little baby. So, but she was barking, like a prissy thing. yeah, and she was like, "Uh, uh-uh, there's somebody here. I'm not okay with this." So James Claus, the father, 56, got up and looked out the window to see what was going on. He took a flashlight and was shining it through the window to kind of see who was there. And then someone started pounding on the front door of the house. So is uh, this not uh, uh, right uh, out I'm of just a thinking horror like movie? Strangers. Yes, yes, mm-hmm. exactly. So somebody's Mm-mm. pounding on the front door, and James goes to the front door. And so they've got like a wooden, they have a storm door that this person opened, and then they have the wooden main front door. And there's like, you know, the little like kind of window pane right in the center. I mean, it's definitely bigger than a peephole, but that's what you would use it for. He's looking through that to see who it is. And he says, show me your badge, thinking maybe this is a police officer or something, but also making sure like, I'm not opening the door for somebody who doesn't have a badge at one in the morning. Like, what is this? Mm -hmm. At this time, Denise Kloss, 46, which is James's wife, and the couple's 13-year-old daughter, Jamie, went into the bathroom and barricaded themselves in the tub behind the shower curtain. And what they did was they pulled from like the bathroom sink, like vanity area, Denise pulled the drawer open from it so that if you tried to open the door, it was close enough, you couldn't get it open, which is very smart. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. they get into the bathtub and they're kind of like huddled together. And then they hear a gunshot. Denise dials 911 from her cell phone, but before she could even tell the dispatcher what was going on, the door busted down. And you really can't tell. Did you hear the 911 call? Mm-mm. It's really just muffle. Like it, you can you can hear some noise. I mean, you can hear a lot of noise, but it's very much like it almost sounds like a whooshing if that makes sense. Like there's just a lot going on, but you can hear multiple voices. You know, it's not just one person. And it's only like 40 seconds long and then the line goes dead. And during that time, the dispatchers sent officers to the location. When police arrived only like four minutes later, they found James Kloss deceased in the front doorway, a gunshot wound to his face. As they entered the home, they found Denise Kloss deceased in the bathtub with a gunshot wound to the head. As they searched the rest of the house, they noticed photos of a young girl with the couple on the walls in an empty bedroom that belonged to a teenage girl. They found the family dog, Molly, cowering alone in the house. And she was like shaking. She was so scared. It was so pitiful. so sad. Yeah. But Jamie Kloss was gone. It's like terrifying. It's the, it's my great, I think it's all of our greatest fear. Yeah. Right? Like totally. James and Denise Kloss were married in Las Vegas on June 9th, 2003. That sounds like a fun wedding. I don't know any other details about it. I just know it was in Vegas and it sounds fun. The pictures are really adorable. Well, there's only one picture that I saw, but it was really adorable. I'm hoping that it was not unlike, but not like Ross and Rachel's in Vegas. (laughs) Hello, Maybe they had their faces, (laughs) (laughs) their faces painted and things like that. Yeah, good time. Mm -hmm. At the time of their deaths, they had both worked at the Ginny O. Turkey factory in Barron for nearly 30 years. And they kind of combined it. Like 
Denise is 10 years younger than James, so I'm sure she probably didn't work there for 27 years, but they just said they worked there for 27 years. I'm like, I think they're combining it. Right. James was a huge Green Bay Packers fan and could be found talking about sports, either current or reminiscing about his high school sports glory days. They did a lot of like family get-togethers and cookouts and stuff like that. So you could usually find him wherever the sports talk was going to be. He was very into sports. That's exactly opposite of where you could find me. I'm at the veggie tray. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Like not talking about sports. Do we have more (laughs) broccoli? Where are the snow peas? Let's get get on that. How many cucumbers do we have? Yeah, exactly. I don't want to run out. No, of course not. No. And they really don't put enough broccoli or snow peas in a veggie tray, if we're being honest. No. Why? Why do they put so many carrots? I mean, I'm not against carrots, but it's like, Let's half that and do some more broccoli. And the tomatoes? Come on. I don't need that many tomatoes. No. Cherry tomatoes? Get out of here. Come on. Denise loved gardening. She had like a bird feeder that she really enjoyed, like watching the birds, feeding the birds. And she taught religious school at her church, which was St. Peter's Catholic Church in a nearby town. I think the town was called Cameron. So again, like there's not a lot in Barron. You kind of have to go out to get to other stuff. Jamie was in eighth grade at Riverview Middle School. She enjoyed jazz dancing, playing volleyball, and Starbucks Frappuccinos. We're besties. Yes. Mm -hmm. Her dog, Molly, was her everything, according to her aunt, Jennifer Smith. So Jamie, like, really wanted a dog, and her parents were like, eh, I really don't think we should get a dog. And Jamie was like, Gotta have this dog. I love, I really want a dog. Like, Jamie's like, oh, we're getting a dog. We're getting a dog. And finally, Denise was like, okay, you can have a dog. And then like Molly was like the princess of the house. Like Jamie did everything with her. It's like a really well, cute relationship. She sounds like some, you know, the dog sounds like there would be no other way than being the princess of the house, you know? I know, yeah. That like teeny little dog named Molly. Like I'm pretty sure Jamie would have a, like that little like dog person like carry her around with her and stuff. Like it's cute. <laughs> yeah. And Molly would just be like, I'm just happy to be around you. Yeah. Hey, I love you. I'm loving everything about you. I'm cherishing you. As police come through the crime scene, they looked for clues as to who may have done this or where Jamie could be. Initially, when they entered the house, they thought that maybe James could have committed suicide. So there's actually audio out there of like the police and their their radio broadcast of like them arriving at the home and all this stuff. And they're like, okay, you know, we've got somebody at the front door. They're like single gunshot wound. But they thought that maybe he could have committed suicide, but they were like, eh, well, hang on. I don't see a gun nearby. Let's not rush to judgment. I mean, at least, you know, they did that. They didn't take that and run with it. Yeah. And they hadn't cleared the rest of the house. I mean, all they saw was this one person. So it's like, yeah, you, yeah, we don't know what happened here. So if it's not a sawed off shotgun, isn't it really difficult to shoot yourself in the face? I would With think. a shotgun. Yeah. Because I watched that Soaked in Bleach documentary about Kurt Cobain. And they were saying, like, basically, he would have had to use his feet to pull the trigger to shoot himself. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if... So if if James was looking through that glass pane and somebody... You have it pointing at... You know, it it, it went through the window. So <laughs> he can't do that. Like... Yeah. You know, but this is just first glance. They're like, you know, well, hang on, we don't see the gun here, whatever. So, crime scene investigators removed items from the house, hoping to find some DNA or physical evidence that would lead them to a suspect, but they found nothing. Sheriff Chris Fitzgerald gave a press conference later that morning to notify the community of Jamie's disappearance and the murder of her parents. And he seemed very emotionally invested in this case. He was like, on it. I mean, you can even hear him like kind of getting a little bit emotional in it. Um, He's just, I mean, the whole community though, like immediately they organized searches. There were thousands of searchers and they're like combing through the fields and the forest of any sign where Jamie could have gone. And they just came together. They were, you know, hosting vigils and they were praying and they just never lost hope of finding Jamie alive. It was it was like on bull, billboards everywhere. Like, you know, we're looking for you, Jamie. Bring Jamie home. Like all this stuff. They were, 
I'm sure that it crossed people's minds that obviously what's the likelihood she's going to come home alive, but they really didn't publicly let themselves go there. It was like, we're going to find her. She's coming home. That's sweet. Shara Fitzgerald never lost hope either, and he never really entertained the idea that Jamie could have been a co-conspirator in her parents' death and her disappearance. He believed from the beginning that Jamie was a missing and endangered child, and he issued an Amber Alert right away. And, you know, there's some people who are like, did she set this up? I mean, we've seen it happen, you know? It's even somebody that young. Mm -hmm. But there was really no evidence of that. There was nothing that they found in the home, in, you know, phone records or anything like that that suggested that she had a boyfriend or something that she ran away with or anything like that. And we say this in so many cases, and it feels like every single town says this kind of thing doesn't happen here, but it le- it legitimately doesn't happen in Barron. Like, this is the thing that does not happen in Barron. So there had been no murders in Barron in the last several years, and only four total in the entire decade before this happened. Wow. Four. I mean, it's a very small town. It's 3,400 or whatever, but I mean, you look at Bardstown. Mm-hmm. Na 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 na, <laughs> and there's a lot, you know, and it's a very small it's like town. The murder capital of the world, right Basically, now. Basically, I know. So it just, it really was a city that people were like, okay, we don't get murders here. Like, what's going on? People didn't even feel the need to lock their doors in 2018 before this happened. And I think there's also like a kind of security in living in a very rural area, like. That feeling of being so far removed from everyone else that if something like that was going to happen, it'd have to be someone that like knew you or knew where you lived, that like a random act of violence wasn't likely to happen to you because someone would have to be deliberate to find you. Like it's not like you live in a neighborhood and kids, you know, looking to rob a place just happen upon your house or whatever. It's like you kind of have to know where to find this house. Yeah. You don't just happen upon an isolated house in the middle of nowhere with like miles away neighbors. Yeah, exactly. And I used to try to tell myself that logic when I would get real scared when we lived in the country. I'd be like, Torella, that noise out there is probably an animal. We live in the middle of nowhere. Nobody is coming to kill you. You probably haven't pissed anybody off that bad. Like there's probably not somebody coming to find you. And then I'd be like, no, they're definitely, I'm dead. I'm dead. They're coming to kill me. I'm dead. (laughs) Like it did not make me feel better, but I think a person with normal logical sense would be like, I feel safer That's out in the country. Happen. Everything's yeah. fine. Yes. Yeah, but not me. I'm like, they're coming for me and nobody's going to hear my screams. <laughs> it's the only thing the country is doing for me is muffling my screams. As the investigation got underway, law enforcement asked residents for tips leading to Jamie's whereabouts. They asked residents to watch neighbors for suspicious behavior. You know, they tell people a lot of times when somebody commits something like this, they'll act differently after they might change their hair color suddenly. They might look differently. They might change jobs. They might miss work or go into a deep depression or something, you know, like Mm -hmm. look for things out of the ordinary. In the weeks after Jamie's disappearance, officials offered a $25,000 reward for information leading to Jamie's return. And then Genio, the turkey factory where the classes worked, matched the 25K. So that brought the total reward to 50,000. Wow. That's huge. I mean, that's really that is, yeah. nice. Go, Jenny O. I know. Detectives were running down every lead, and there were over 2,000 of them by the end of the investigation, but no results. Then on October 29th, two weeks after the abduction and the murders, a 32-year-old man was arrested for burglarizing the Kloss home. Kyle Janky Annis entered the Kloss home shortly after 2.30 a.m. through a patio door. By this time, police had installed motion-activated security cameras. So he was big fat caught immediately. That's so smart. Yeah, yeah. They were. I would have never thought to do that. I know, I wouldn't either. I mean, this guy ended up not having anything to do with it, but still, like, yeah, that's so smart because you never know. If the guy's going to come back to the scene. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the security cameras showed him entering the house, and so the police are alerted. And they go to the house. And by the time he's coming out of the house, they're like, hey, we're here to arrest you. And he's like, got me. Totally got me. (laughs) So 
They found on him two girls' tank tops and one pair of underwear. And he admitted to entering the home without permission and stealing items that he thought, quote unquote, nobody would miss. And he did have a connection, I guess, technically to the Kloss residence or the Kloss family because he also worked at Jenny O, but he never even met them or anything. I guess he just saw it in the news. And he said that the reason he ended up going there was because he was just curious about what size Jamie wore. I hate it. Is that not so disgusting? I know. I'm like, ew. Ew, ew. Why Ew. her? Un- I mean, we know why her underwear. I don't like that at all. Oh yeah, no. I don't like that at all. Yuck. Police looked into him, but cleared him of any involvement in the murders and abduction. He was charged with burglary, but he was just a creep looking for teenage girls' clothes. Like, what the fuck is wrong with him? Why like, can't people be charged for just being fucking weird? I know. Like, what a fucking creepo. You're charged with three counts of creepo. Creepo. Yeah. Did you just make that up? No, people say creepo. I don't think anybody says creepo. Weirdo, sure. Creepo, not a thing. Uh-oh, am I mixing it up? <laughs> You're to the age where you start saying things like creepo. <laughs> oh, no. I'm going to start calling kids in the neighborhood jokers or whatever. That's what old people <laughs> exactly. say. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> what a Yahoo over there driving too fast. I know. Oh, no. Those damn juvenile delinquents. I know. But also, I mean, my four-year-old went ahead and told everybody at his daycare that I'm super old because I can't see anymore. That's true. You've been dealing with that for a long time. I've never been able to see, yeah. But he went ahead and told his friends at school, my mom has really bad eyesight. And the other kid was like, well, I can see. And Ben goes, well, you won't when you're old. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. That's cool. sweet. Yes. <laughs> and I asked him about it last night. I'm like, hey, I heard you told everybody I don't I have bad eyesight because I'm old. And he was like, yeah. <laughs> this is What's the problem? true. What's the problem? I was like, okay, all right. Okay. So there's that. But the holidays came to Barron, but nobody felt like celebrating. Jamie was still gone. And by this time, it's December. On December the 12th, the town hosted a lighting of a tree of hope outside of Riverview Middle School in honor of the Kloss family and in hopes of finding Jamie alive. Residents sent food to law enforcement who were working around the clock to find Jamie and run down the more 2,000 leads they'd received in the case. There was an outpouring of support from everyone in the entire town, it seemed like. Like, Everybody, people who owned restaurants, like just residents, everybody was just constantly, they said, like dropping food by the sheriff's department, checking in, see how everything's going. Like they kept them stocked because they were working all the time. That's sweet. Yeah, I know. It's such a horribly tragic story, but there really is so much hope in it. Like these, this whole town just like never gave that up. They never let themselves be like, okay, worst case scenario is happening. Mm -hmm. And they just did everything they could to find this little girl. So sweet. Christmas came and went. People exchanged presents, but Jamie's presents from her family stayed wrapped under the tree. They couldn't let themselves think the unimaginable. They believed she would come home and still be able to open them. And then something happened. On January 10th, so now this is 2019, Jean, I don't know if it's Jean or Jeannie, in the 911 call, it sounds like they're calling her Jamie. So I'm thinking maybe it's what? Jeannie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, maybe. Because I kept thinking the 911 operator was calling her, mistaking that her name was Jamie and not that Jamie's name was Jamie. But so maybe it's Jeannie. I'm, all right, I'm going to call her Jeannie. Enough of this. Okay. Jeannie Nutter was walking her dog in Eau Claire Acres, a development of cabins near the Eau Claire River. Most of the cabins stay unoccupied in the winter, and Jeannie isn't even normally at her cabin in the winter, but luckily on this day, she was there and happened to be walking her dog in the snow. Again, this is Wisconsin. This is (laughs) January. This is like, I would not even know how to handle myself in this. Mm -mm. I could not do it. Ooh, so much snow. It's not my jam. Yeah. Not me either. Uh, I will look at snow all day long. Will not, I do not want to be around it. I don't want to feel Mm -mm, it. mm -mm. I don't want it to touch my clothes. I don't want it to get me all wet. I don't want that like 
I don't want I don't want to be cold. No, I don't I want hate to do that. Being cold really pisses me off. So hate yeah. It. Everybody yeah. who can live there and like it, like it's great. I think it's cool. I think it's really Good pretty, but yeah. Oh, it's I don't beautiful. Do it. Yeah. Can't do it. At around 4 p.m., she saw a girl walking toward her in the snow. The girl was dirty. She appeared malnourished, had matted hair, and was wearing a pair of New Balance sneakers that were way too large for her and no coat. And this is like snow central. So she needs a coat. Mm -hmm. She kept getting closer to Jeannie and she said, I'm lost. I don't know where I am and I need help. And then she said, I'm Jamie. And Jeannie immediately was like, I just got chills again, like just talking about it. Oh, it's so crazy. Because Jeannie's like, I know who you are. Like immediately I knew when she said, I'm Jamie, I knew who she was because it was all over the news. And this, they were in a town called Gordon, which is like 70 something miles away from Barron. But it was, I mean, all over the news everywhere. So she knew exactly who she was looking at. She held on to Jamie and they walked to the nearest house where Kristen and Peter Kasinkas lived. When Kristen opened the door, Jeannie said, this is Jamie Kloss, call 911. And they immediately called. 911. Hi, I have um, a young lady at my house right now and she just says her name is Jamie Kloss. Okay, what's your address? One four. It's in Gordon, Wisconsin. Okay, have you seen her photo, ma'am? Yes, it Does is it, her. I 100% think it is her. Are you, okay. 100%. Does it look like she's going to run? No. She's sitting down. She's relaxing. Okay, hang on just a second. So how did she come up upon your cabin? I was walking my dog, and we were almost home, and she was walking towards me crying, saying, you got to help me, you got to help me. Okay. So I didn't want to go into my cabin because it's too close to Patterson's house. And she said her her name is Janie Claus? Yep. And when I walked into this house, they recognized her immediately from police. Okay. Okay. So I don't, Jamie, do you know when he's going to come back? He thought he was going to come back home and see Who is Who's going to come back? What, his name is Jake Patterson. Jake Thomas Patterson, she says. Okay, hang name. on. And apparently he comes two doors down from our cabin. Oh, Henry, get off the couch. I'm sorry. I'm here. You can just, why don't you hang on to me, Jamie? Maybe good for you to pat a dog. If you can't get any other information as far as being cold, then if anyone else is with their so we're not locked into something we don't know. So we're kind of scared because he might come. Yep. So if the cops could get here soon, we would love to. I have, um, I have many deputies headed that way. I'm going to keep you on the line. Okay. And she said, I am Jamie Claus. Yes. She said, he killed my parents. I want to go home. Help me. And what was the male's name? Jake. Is it Jake? Jake Patterson? Jake Patterson. And she said Jake, he killed her parents and she wants to go home? Yes. She didn't know where she was. When I saw her, she was saying, where am I? Where am I? And I okay. said, you're in Wisconsin. And did she say he's gone right now? Yes. Are they at a cabin? Well, I think it's, uh, he lives there year-round. And he's supposed to be back at midnight? Yes. And she says on the call that, because the 911 operator is like, have you seen a picture of Jamie Kloss? And she's like, oh yeah, and I know this is 100% her. Like, this is totally her. I know it's her. They were all scared that he would come looking for her. And it was close enough. I mean, I don't know even how far she walked. It was close enough that she walked it, but everything so spread out there, it still had to have Mm -hmm. been a good walk for her. So they locked the doors and Peter stood guard with a gun at the front door and watched for anybody coming. And they were like, we're not going to open the door for anybody but the police. Like, we've got her in here and we're going to keep her safe. So law enforcement got there at about 4.45 p.m. And the 88-day ordeal for Jamie Kloss was finally over. She never had to be a prisoner again. She identified her captor as 21-year-old Jake Patterson. 
Law enforcement went to find him. Jake had just gotten home as Jamie was being held waiting for law enforcement to arrive. So he gets home and he noticed she's gone and he sees footprints outside and he's like, oh shit. He jumps in his car, which is a red Ford Taurus, and he starts driving to go find her. As police were transporting Jamie to the police station, they passed a red car driving in the opposite direction. And she wasn't sure if that was his car or not. She knew it looked like his car, but she just couldn't be positive that was his or not. So they ran the plates on it and it came back registered to last name Patterson. And they're like, bingo, bongo, this is him. So they pull him over. He just puts his hands in the air and he says, I know what this is about and I did it. That's it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Jake Patterson was 21 when he murdered James and Denise Kloss and abducted Jamie. He was living in his father's rural cabin in Gordon, Wisconsin alone. He grew up in Wisconsin and graduated in 2015 with a very small graduating class of 34 students. It's like the teeniest. Oh, yeah. Talk about knowing everybody. Exactly. His friends and family described him as quiet, not a loner, just quiet. He was well-liked. He had friends. I mean, he wasn't like... It wasn't like he never talked to anybody kind of thing. You would expect somebody who was kind of a total loner. I feel like you hear that a lot and stuff like this. Yeah, or like somebody like Princess Diaries where they're like, oh, I got sat on again today. Yeah, well, he kind of You know, somebody that. like fades into the background. Yeah, he does. Like, people liked him. He had friends, but he was also that kind of like forgettable kind of person. Like, there were people where like... So his parents had divorced when he was 11, maybe. And so his mom moved a couple towns over and his dad lived, I don't know, still in the area, closer than his mom did. And when he would go to visit like his mom or go visit his dad or whatever... The people in all these towns knew each other, so they knew who he was, but they would kind of forget about him in general. Like, it's like Anne on Arrested Development. Yes, he's Egg. That's exactly what he is. (laughs) He's Egg. It's like he's there, but you just don't, you're like, who was that again? Have I met you before? I bet people all the time are like, have we met? I don't remember meeting you. And he's like, yeah, we've met 11 times. That's so sad. I know, it is kind of sad, but that's kind of what he seemed like he was. He loved playing board games like Risk. That was his favorite. He was... Man, I hate Risk. I hate strategy games. Mm, I've never played Risk. I've actually never played Risk either, but I hate strategy games. Just kidding. (laughs) Uh, Stop it. I hate like strategy games that take like two years to complete. Yeah, it always seemed like that's just going to go on forever. And I just thought like, I have, I don't have enough commitment for this. No. You know? Yeah. And he was prematurely balding. So he was only 21 and he was already going bald. Like, that sucks. Yikes. That is, yeah. He had trouble holding down a job. He didn't stay places very long. Um, And he kind of seems like he has absolutely no personality. His senior quote in his yearbook was, I'm finally done with school. That's it. Wow. Yeah. It's like, you know, the yearbook people are like, hey, give us your quote. Because they can get a quote from everybody in the senior class there. There's only 34 people. And he's like, well, I'm done with school. We're like, (laughs) okay. Well, thanks. (laughs) It's like that kid the other day that drove by and told you, you have a purse. (laughs) That was the weirdest (laughs) thing. I wish I could have taken a picture of what my face looked like because I just sat there as a question mark. It was kind of like... Like Kermit Crinkle face. Like you were just like, huh? (laughs) And then he was like, (laughs) okay, bye, and drove away. And I was still just like, what? What happened? (laughs) He stops her in the Target parking lot to to just tell her that she's got a purse. Yeah. It's just, you know, one of those like weird kid things that they think is hilarious. And it's just like, okay. Yeah, I was like, whatever. What? Uh, Well, immediately I'm thinking, are you trying to distract me so somebody can steal my purse? Like, what's going on? (laughs) I legitimately was like, I'm in danger here. Oh my gosh. I know it. I mean, it's the nature of the beast, isn't it? Either that or he was checking out my ass. I didn't know. I mean, could be both. You never know. But yeah, he was like, you have a purse. And I was like, (laughs) what? Go away. (laughs) He never dated in school, ever. He never even 
talked about girls. Like all of his friends in school were like, he didn't have any girlfriends. He didn't talk about girls. He didn't talk about liking girls, wanting a girlfriend, like none of that. It just didn't seem important to him. And the only thing he really talked about as far as like a life goal was that he wanted to join the Marines, which he did. And it didn't last very long. He was discharged only five weeks after beginning training. And the Marine Corps' only statement regarding the reason for the discharge was, the character of his service was incongruent with Marine Corps expectations and standards. What does that mean? (laughs) I know, it's so vague. And his grandfather attributed this to health issues, but he wouldn't elaborate on those. Like when they said what kind of health issues, he said internal. (laughs) What does that even mean? (laughs) What kind of health issues? Physical. Yeah, like, okay, all right. That's, I mean, I guess there's mental health too, but yeah, it just seemed. Well, yeah, it's just, it's the most vague thing ever. Yeah, exactly. It's just like, Yes. What kind of health issues? Medical. Yeah, exactly. It, yeah, there's nothing there. So, I mean, it kind of seems like though that what that it might be more like behavioral because... I would guess based on what I know about this man. <laughs> well, yeah. And like the fact that they said the character of his service, like it doesn't seem like he had any kind of a physical impairment that would like make it impossible for him to like do some of what the training required or something. It seems more like statements he made or I don't know, something like that. It just doesn't. Yeah. That's what it sounds like to me, but they won't say, so we don't know. After graduation, friends said that like, you know, the kind of core friends that he had said that he just stopped talking to them altogether. Like they said, by the time all this happened, it had been years since they'd heard from him. You just quit talking to them. And there didn't appear to be any connection between Jake Patterson and the Kloss family either. He had worked for a very brief time at the Jenny O factory where the Klosses worked, but he never worked with them and never met them. And it seemed like a lot of people in that area either worked there or like had family that did. It was a large source of employment opportunity for that area. It was like the I one how place big you could this work. is. What? The the factory. Because oh. it sounds like a ton of people work there and didn't know. For it to be such a small town, I'm guessing it's like a bunch of rural, mm-hmm. like bordering uh, cities would come in for that. And so it was big enough toward, yeah, even exactly. though it was such a small town, there yeah. were tons of people that were like, oh, I've never met her. Well, I mean, even, even Jake working there, he lived... I mean, at the time of this, he lived 70 miles away. I don't know that that's where he lived when he worked at Genio, but he definitely, I don't think he ever lived in Barron, you know? So yeah, he would have driven mm-hmm. in, he would have commuted for it. So yeah. The quote unquote connection between Jake Patterson and Jamie Kloss would prove to be absolutely terrifying. In the fall of 2018, since so this is early October, Jake worked for two days at the Saputo Cheese Factory in Almina, Wisconsin. He made it two days there. On one of those days, one of the two, he drove home through Barron and he was behind a school bus on his way home. So he's driving super far to this job because at this time he does live in Gordon. So he's behind Mm -hmm. this school bus and the school bus is on its morning route, taking kids to school, picking them up. It stops in front of the Kloss house. Jamie walks out to get on the bus. This is his first introduction to Jamie. He doesn't know her name. He doesn't know who lives at her house. He doesn't know anything about her. He doesn't know specifically how old she is. He just looks at her and says, I'm going to take that girl. And it was just like such a chance encounter because had it been, had he been what, 10 minutes earlier or later, he wouldn't have been behind that. You know, it's just like, he never mm-hmm. would have come into contact with the Kloss residence. And because of just the way that that worked out, he did. And he only worked there for two days. He That's later... awful. I know, it's so scary because it's just like, I don't know, random. They're all scary to me, I guess. I just, they're scary in different ways, you know? He later told police that he'd been considering taking a girl for about two years by that point. 
it was like a year into him first having this desire that he began to think about it specifically, like how he would go about it and what preparations he would make rather than just the general, you know, your run of the mill, I want to abduct a girl, normal thoughts one has. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, typical classic, everybody's done it, right? Yeah, exactly. So it's like a year later, he's like, you know what? I'm going to take this to the next level. He immediately started making plans that day when he saw her. He went to Walmart. He got a ski mask. Um, he shaved his head. He shaved his facial hair because he didn't want to leave any physical evidence behind. He didn't want to leave a hair behind. He started researching the different types of guns to use and decided on a 12-gauge shotgun because he thought that would inflict the most damage. He landed... What is wrong with this man? I know. He landed on a Mossberg like brand or type or whatever. I don't know what you call them. Because his research told him that this one was very, very common and it would be harder for the police to track down. He didn't just go with... Yeah, this is diabolical. This man is so dangerous. It's not even funny. Yes, it's so scary. He made, he started making like superficial modifications to his car. He took like the regular license plate off of it. He put a different one on. He started making like little changes so that, you know, so that people couldn't be like, oh, well, that one had a tail light out or that, you know, I saw a car leaving the scene that had this or that. He started making small changes so that there would be like an identifier on it that he would later be able to remove. And it would be like, oh, well, that's not the same car. That's scary. It's terrifying. He drove to the Kloss home twice before October 15th. So again, it was early October that he first spotted her. He abducts her by October the 15th. So he sees her and immediately goes into action. And he went there twice, but there were either like a lot of cars in the area or I think the second time he went, there were actually lights on in the home. Somebody seemed to still be awake. So he got scared off and he left. But on October 15th, he was like, I'm not leaving without her. And he brought the gun with him. And he said that he knew that he couldn't leave any witnesses that could identify him. And he just kept telling himself, it's either them or me. And that's how he kind of like justified killing them. Like, if I don't kill them, they'll kill me. And I've got to take this girl. It's, uh, uh, I'm so angry. I know, it's horrible. He told investigators that he turned his lights off and coasted into the driveway. Wearing his ski mask, steel toe boots, and dark clothing, he approached the front door. When he got there, he said that he started banging on it and he said, open the fucking door. And that's when James Claus said, let me see your badge. And he's like, he obviously thought I was a police officer. He wanted to see my badge or whatever. He shot through the window pane as James tried to look through to see who was at the door. He then shot the like doorknob to gain entry to the home. Because again, he he was wearing gloves, but he didn't want to touch anything. He didn't want to open the door. So he shot it to just try to avoid having to touch anything. Terrifying. Mm -hmm. Stepping over James's body, he cleared the house and there was only one door in the house that wouldn't open the bathroom. He attempted to kick it down, but it wouldn't budge because of that drawer behind it. So he just started ramming it with his shoulder. And he said it took like 10 to 15 times of ramming it with his full body weight. And he's like 6'3 and 180 pounds or something or close to 200. I can't remember. But it took him 10 to 15 times. And then the drawer that was holding the door shut split apart. And he was able to get in. And he pulled open the shower curtain. He found Jamie and Denise inside. I think he turned the phone off and threw it because it was like when the police got there and they found it, it was either in the doorway of the bathroom or it had gone like in the hall, but it wasn't with Denise anymore. He told Denise to duct tape Jamie's mouth and... She was having trouble doing it the way that he wanted her to, I guess. It wasn't as tight as he wanted it or something. So he actually set his gun down, taped her mouth, her wrists and her ankles himself. And then he said, he turned his head. He aimed for Denise's head. She's in the bathtub. He turns his head and pulls the trigger so he doesn't have to see her be shot. Wow, what a fucking coward. I know. And he's like, I just couldn't look at it. Like, are you serious? Well, I mean, it's horrible. It's just horrible. But 
So then he, I'm sure Jamie had to see it. Oh, yeah. She's not blindfolded. Mm -hmm. It's awful. It's just like, if you're going, don't, this is terrible. I have no no words to say about it because I want to say like, if you're going to do it, then look at what you're doing. But then I'm like, no, don't do it. That's terrible. Yeah, like, exactly. Don't do but, it. But I do hope that that's something that like haunts you for the rest of your life. Never like, leaves him. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So he takes Jamie and he brings her to his car. And on the way out, they have to step over her father's body and he slips and almost falls in his blood because there's so much blood. And he shoves her in the trunk and closes it and they're off. So he spent only a total of four minutes in the Kloss home. Like from the time that he busted the door open, he was in there for four minutes. And because Denise had called 911, the cops were on the way. So he leaves the house and they actually passed him on the road. And he pulled over and like, you know, did what you're supposed to do when law enforcement is coming with their lights on. He pulled over and they saw him. But... You know, they were going to the Ugh. house. Yeah. So close. I know. And they even, the that morning when they were there, like securing the scene and all that, one of the cops mentioned that car and they said, there was a red car that we passed on the way here. I wonder, you know, because it sounded like probably the person was still in the house when the call was going on. And they tried to get their dash cam footage to see if they could get his license plate number, but they couldn't. So mm. they just, you know, and Jamie is in the trunk and she hears the sirens coming and she's probably like, oh my gosh, here they come. And then she hears them fade away in the distance. And it's like, now what? I'm stuck. That's I can't terrible. imagine what yeah. she was going through. No, just complete loss of hope, probably. Absolutely. They drove for what she said felt like two hours and they arrived at Jake's home in Gordon. A sign above the door reads Patterson's Retreat. It was like his dad's cabin and he ended up staying there by himself, like his poor family too. Oh God. Right. There he burned Jamie's clothes, his gloves and the duct tape in the basement. He gave Jamie a pair of his sister's pajamas to wear and made space for her underneath his twin size bed. So he's sleeping in a twin size bed. He puts her underneath it. She sleeps on the floor. And then when he is gone for whatever reason, he doesn't work right now. Whenever he's gone, it, when he has people over, his dad visited him every Saturday the whole time. And he didn't know that she was in his bedroom. Oh my so God. So he would put like weights, like barbells and dumbbells and stuff in like totes around the side of the bed because it's just a space of two and a half feet there. I can't imagine, like, I guess she wasn't claustrophobic. I hope she wasn't because my goodness, that would be horrible. And he would like put all that stuff around so that she couldn't get out. And then he just turned the radio up. And I guess he just trusted that she wasn't going to make any noise while people were there. Mm -hmm. He would scream at her. He would be very threatening. He would tell her bad things were going to happen to her if she didn't keep quiet, if she didn't listen, if she didn't stay there, you know, all this stuff. He was, he did a lot of things to terrify her into listening to him. And for a little while, it worked. Um, there were a couple times though that he said he thought she tried to get out from under the bed. So he flipped out and he said she knew better than to do that again. And on one occasion, he had some kind of a, like rod from a tool or something and he hit her in the back with it because he was so angry at her. But then like other times he would make her play games with him. Like they'd play board games, they'd play cards, you know, and she's probably like, this is obviously something she's being forced to do. She's not enjoying this. And I don't know if he's just like, oh, we're friends and we're playing cards or whatever. He said they would talk right. a lot. And when asked what they talked about, he was just like, well, we just talked about anything, like everything. We just did the only thing we didn't talk about is the situation we were currently in. It's just so weird. So strange. Yeah. Yes. After about two weeks of having Jamie in his home, he thought he'd gotten away with it and that authorities were never going to locate her. And he said, Well, after a while, I thought, well, I could get away with this. I mean, I understand how when there's no connection, a person has no connection to someone how that's fucking impossible to solve or really hard to solve. So he just kind of thought, 
I'm good. He put the normal plates back on his car. Before that, he was sleeping with a shotgun outside the bedroom door so that if the police got to his house, he could fight them off, basically. But after that, two weeks went by, he was like, they don't have anything on me. They have no idea it was me. They're never going to find her. Yeah. So he went to his grandparents for Christmas dinner. He left Jamie under the bed for over 12 hours at times with no food, water, or bathroom breaks. And everybody in his family was like, he didn't act any differently. He seemed like the same old Jake at Christmas dinner, hanging out with the grandparents, exchanging presents, giving everybody hugs and Merry Christmas and all that. Like, normal as could be. That's so messed up. That's so messed up. Yeah. And every one of them knew about the case. It was in the news all the time. Like, you know, and they're just like, we're spending Christmas with him and he has her under his bed. And we don't know it. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine? Yeah, just knowing that. that's There's so much damage that has been inflicted to everybody. And we talk about it all the time. Like, it's just something that it, it spider webs out and everybody's affected. It's Yes, absolutely. So on January 10th, 2019, Jake told Jamie that he'd be gone for a few hours. He left the home in Gordon to apply for a job at a liquor distributor. On his application that day, he had the nerve to write... Honest and hardworking in the skills box. (laughs) Honest and hardworking. Somebody had jokes and he brought them with him. That's what happened there. Yeah. He was like, "Um, I guess the ability to abduct strangers is not the type of skill you're looking for. So I'm going to leave that off of this one. Yeah. What the Although it's hardworking even... He worked hard to get Jamie, but he couldn't last more than two days at the cheese factory. So it's like... Right. Hmm. His ambition is misplaced, I would say. Yes. At, yes. at the very least. <laughs> yes. So he's gone applying for this job because he's such a hard worker and very honest. And Jamie is like, this is my opportunity. So she makes a run for it. After Jake was arrested, he confessed and pleaded guilty to all counts. After he pleaded guilty, as he left the courtroom that day, Jamie didn't go to court that day, but he kind of looked around and was just like, bye, Jamie. And everybody was like, who the fuck are you talking to? She's not here. Like, who? Yeah, it was just sort of like, he was just like putting it out there, I guess. (laughs) I don't know. Yeah, and it's gross. I'm sure she's like, Ew, don't talk about me. Don't say my name. Don't talk about me. We're not friends. Don't say Mm -hmm. bye to me. Like, no, none of that. Ugh, awful. No, no, no. He was convicted of two counts of murder and one count of kidnapping, and he was sentenced to two life sentences plus 40 years. Jamie's attorney read her statement at his sentencing hearing. Judge, this is the statement of Jamie Kloss. Okay. Last October, Jake Patterson took a lot of things that I love away from me. It makes me the most sad that he took away my mom and my dad. I loved my mom and dad very much. And they loved me very much. They did all they could to make me happy and protect me. He took them away from me forever. I felt safe in my home and I love my room and all of my belongings. He took all of that too. I don't want to even see my home or my stuff because of the memory of that night. My parents and my home were the most important things in my life. He took them away from me in a way that will always leave me with a horrifying memory. I have to have an alarm on the house now just so I can sleep. I used to love to go out with my friends I love to go to school. I love to do dance. He took all of those things away from me too. It's too hard for me to go out in public. I get scared and I get anxious. These are just ordinary things that anyone like me should be able to do, but I can't because he took them away from me. But there are some things that Jake Patterson can never take from me. He can't take my freedom. He thought that he could own me, but he was wrong. I was smarter. 
I watched his routine and I took back my freedom. I will always have my freedom and he will not. Jake Patterson can never take away my courage. He thought he, control, he could control me, but he couldn't. I feel like what he did is what a coward would do. I was brave and he was not. He can never take away my spirit. He thought that he could make me like him, but he was wrong. He can't ever change me or take away who I am. He can't stop me from being happy and moving forward with my life. I will go on to do great things in my life and he will not. Jake Patterson will never have any power over me. I feel like I have some power over him because I get to tell the judge what I think should happen to him. He stole my parents from me. He stole almost everything I loved from me. For 88 days, he tried to steal me and he didn't care who he hurt or who he killed to do that. He should stay locked up forever. And it's just so like, you know, she's just like, he's not, he doesn't run my life. He's not going to take the power away from me. He doesn't have any power over me anymore. I'm the one that has the power. Like, Good for her. Yeah, she's, I mean, I'm sure I. there's going to be a lot of counseling that has to happen there. And mm -hmm. a lot of healing. Yeah, a lot of healing. And she's so young. Mm -hmm. But she seems like a very, very strong little girl. I hope at the very least she got Molly back because that's just one thing that's like stability for her probably. Yeah, yeah, she definitely did because she lives with her aunt and uncle now. And they have Molly too. So, And they had Molly Thank during okay, the whole good, thing. Good, good. And in one of the uh, press conferences that her family did, her aunt was like, Molly sleeping in one of your sweatshirts. Like, you know, she can't wait to be back with you. <laughs> Isn't it so sweet? Uh, I know. Uh, we're, dogs are too pure for this earth. I know. So at the sentencing hearing, Jake gave... And at times emotional statement, basically just being like, if I could take it back, I would. If me dying would bring them back, I would do it. I would do anything I could. I don't like, believe it. I yeah, do not believe it. I exactly. do not believe it. I do not believe it. Whatever. The judge didn't believe it either. The judge was like, you are a freaking danger. You said yourself that if it wasn't Jamie, it would be somebody else. Absolutely. Hell no. You can't see the light of day ever again. Mm -hmm. A reporter in the area, Lou Raguse, sent him a letter in prison and Jake wrote him back. So... This guy... Lou Raguse, I love that name. Isn't that a fun name? Yeah. This is silly goose. <laughs> he actually did like a, a full podcast on this case because he was a reporter in the area. So he did like a multi-part series on it. I don't remember the name of it, but I think if you just type Jamie Kloss, you'll find it. But he has a podcast if you want more information. But he sent questions to Jake and then Jake just responded. And he just Jake just gets on my nerves because his response is, "Hi, I DK if I'll actually send this. I'll answer some of your questions, some I can't. I won't put a lot of details anyways." I'm like, "Yeah, he's just so like I DK. I don't know. Like, just write it out. What yeah. else do you have to do?" Like, <laughs> I hate I don't him. Know. I hate he him. Just I hate pisses him. me off. Yeah, there's not one good thing about this man. No. So basically, Lou wanted to know why he confessed and why did he give a lot of detail. And he basically said that he he knew that when he got caught, he wasn't going to fight anything. He thought he would get caught a lot sooner than he did. But he wanted to give them everything so that they didn't have to interview Jamie so that she wouldn't have to relive everything. And they said... And he said they did anyways and hurt her more for no reason. It's like, no, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> this is not the police's fault. This is your fault. Yeah. You're the Look one the police who kidnapped did to hurt her. Jamie. Yeah, exactly. They didn't have to ask her questions about it. I'll answer all the questions. Okay, well. Control, 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 control. Yeah. In what world are we going to be able to trust everything that you say is true, first of all? Yeah, he's whatever. he's honest and hardworking. Exactly. He told you already. Yeah, he already told me. I, I keep forgetting that. I'm so sorry. I know. This was before he pled guilty. So the guy, he asked if he was going to plead guilty. He really didn't give a lot of reason. Like, because 
Lou was like, well, what led you to want to kidnap a girl in the first place? And he just said, it's not black and white. He said, do you have any remorse or regrets for the things that you did? He said, huge amounts. I can't believe I did this. Question five was, what was your long-term plan if Jamie had not escaped that day? And he says, I won't say. It was really stupid, though, looking back. In another interview, he was like, you know, I'm just like really good at not really like thinking about stuff. Really? So I kind of just didn't really think about what would happen. Like, I guess in my mind, I just thought that like eventually... I could just let her have free run of the house and she would just like stay. He should have put that on his application as well. I'm really good at just not really like thinking about anything. Yeah, exactly. I don't really like think about like stuff. He says like a lot. I know people get onto us because we say like a lot, but for a 21 year old dude, he says like a lot. Hmm, like, like a lot, a lot? Like a lot, a lot, a lot. Did your family really have no clue? How often were family members in your cabin and how close did they come to discovering Jamie under the bed? He said, no one knew. My dad only came on Saturdays, the same time every day. So it was a routine. Jamie hides on Saturday. My family respects privacy, so nobody even went into my room. Did you ever return to Barron after the crime or insert yourself into any of the vigils or anything like that? Because, you know, a lot of times people will do that. They'll show up at the searches. They'll, you know, whatever. And he said he mm-hmm. s- stayed completely away from Barron. And he even he even made sure not to bring his phone the night that he abducted her. Like he did, he made sure he never Googled anything about Jamie because he didn't know her name until after he abducted her. He made sure he didn't Google her. He didn't like he would watch the news, but he didn't do anything related to the case on the computer or anything. He wanted that's really scary how good he is at this. Mhm. Yeah, what would have happened had he not been caught? Mhm. Would one girl have been enough? You know? Yeah. Are are we looking at an Ariel oh Castro? Gosh. It'd be like yeah, bone collector. Uh huh. Yeah. <gasps> Terrifying. How closely did you follow the news coverage as, and was Jamie aware of the news coverage and the extent to which people were searching for her? He said, I followed it through my phone. If something popped up on TV about it, I would change the channel. I would tell Jamie, I'm sorry, I can't watch this. IDK what she knew. His IDK is just really fucking pissed me off. Question 10, when in your life did you realize you were capable of doing something like this? I just watched a 2020 special on BTK Killer and he told a reporter he knew as a teen that he wanted to do something like this one day and he was jealous over attention other killers like Ted Bundy were receiving. Did you feel any of those same thoughts? He says, the cops say I planned this thoroughly and that I said that. They're really good at twisting your words around, put them in different spots, straight up lie. Little mad about that. Trying to cover up their mistakes, I guess. This was mostly on impulse. I don't think like a serial killer. Like, again, just... (laughs) Yeah, the the Deflecting, deflecting. Like, uh. This really upsets me. I mean, I ruined so many lives, but look at, you know... How rude the police are. They're twisting my words. Like, come on. What goes through the mind of someone who wants to carry out something like this? He says, at the time, I was really pissed. I didn't quote unquote want to. The reason I did this is complicated. And then he wrote something and scratched it out and said, self-redaction, LOL. And then he says, no one will believe or can imagine how sorry I am for hurting Jamie this much. I can't express it. And then on the back, he said, I'm sorry, Jamie, for everything. I know it doesn't mean much. Okay, thanks. Freaking idiot. I I know, he's the worst. Yeah. The Kloss family home where... James and Denise were murdered, has since been torn down. Jamie has started school and lives with her aunt and uncle. Um, The Kloss family attorney, Chris Gramstrup, who read her statement at the sentencing hearing, said that she spent her first summer without her parents hiking through state parks, reconnecting with friends, and celebrating special occasions with her family, including her 14th birthday. Gramstrup also read a statement on behalf of Jamie She said, I'm very happy to be home and getting back to the activities that I enjoy. I love hanging out with all my friends and I feel stronger every day. And the family attorney said that Jamie's father's strength and her mother's kind, caring heart were both qualities that he believed they had passed on to their daughter. And he said the people around her see her getting stronger too. It's her strength and her heart 
that has and will continue to get her through this and move forward with her life. And that's it. I cannot believe this case. I am so happy that she is safe and I hope that her road to recovery and healing is as gentle and as swift as can be possible. Mm -hmm. And I hope, hope, hope that Jake Patterson cannot sleep at night after what he's done. 100%. I mean, IDK if that's possible, but... We'll see. He ended up having to be moved to a prison in like outside of Wisconsin. I think he's in New Mexico now because of his safety. I mean, even the prisoners in Wisconsin are like, the fuck, dude? You stole a little girl. Wow. She was a little girl. Mm -hmm. 13. Like you see pictures of her and you're like, that's a little that's girl. That's a child. Yeah. Like it's mm -hmm. just disgusting. It is. Everything that I read and found, I don't believe that he ever sexually assaulted her. He said at one point that he felt too guilty to do that. But I think he was probably in his mind just thinking eventually it would happen. Maybe she'd want to or I don't know. But he felt really guilty mm -mm. for killing her parents, he said. He's disgusting. Yeah, I don't... Yeah. So... That's it. So he's in prison for life. And, uh, you know, Jamie's doing the best she can. She's a strong girl, man. Yes, yeah, she is. And her family also said, like, her aunt was like, just the fact that she busted out of there and ran away was kind of uncharacteristic for her because she was very much like a rule follower, very quiet, you know, that kind of stuff. So it just shows, you know, that like survival instinct and her her strength to get up and do that. It's amazing. And however far mm -hmm. she had to walk, it's pretty incredible. It is incredible. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for listening and we will catch you on the next episode. Bye. Bye. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this case. Connect with us on Instagram or Facebook to continue the conversation. Thanks for listening and we will meet you back here next week. Bye. The theme song for the show is created and composed by Stephen Toby. You can find more of Stephen's work on SoundCloud. Our logo was created by Sloan Williams of Sophisticated Crayon. You can find more of her work on Etsy. Visit us at killerqueenspodcast.com for merch and other info about the show. Bye.